B-Lab stands for Breakthrough Lab. It's an opportunity for students to advance ventures of their own creation. B-Lab kind of instills in you to actually think, what is the business? What are you actually trying to sell? Where do we begin? How do we get this out? We have this idea, where do we go with it? And so Brown has uh, put together this, I think, innovative and fantastic program to allow students to work uh, on those ventures in that fashion. I'm going to grease the pan. So it like che is the name pan. of the venture, and Che is a food company which focuses on the healthy snack sector. I heard from a friend on campus about B-Lab, and it seemed like the perfect place to kind of expand on the idea, and the perfect way to spend the summer in order to like cultivate what we wanted to accomplish with Che. Because of B-Lab, we're beginning to think like business people and like founders of a company. The name of our venture, Akeso, is the name of a Greek deity. She's basically the goddess of the process of healing. So in the physical therapy industry, there's a, like, there's a disconnect. So once you're in the clinic, you do exercises. When you're out of the clinic, you should still be doing exercises. Uh, but you know, life gets in the way. Lack of communication is something that we're trying to delve into, something that we want to research more and try to solve. So that's why we're focusing a lot on HEPs, which is the home exercise program. I think B-Lab has been a great resource for us to you know, focus the, our tumble of, of ideas. <laughs> I've never really taken a formal entrepreneurial class or business class, but I've always been really interested in addressing health equity and kind of understanding health disparities from a research side. So it was really a great thing for me to be able to actually work on a project and a business that tries to create a product that is really healthy for you. Also, it's actually taught me to be a better student too because these things are, the, we're learning a lot in B-Lab, but we get, the greatest thing is that we get the opportunity to actually put what we learn into practice. It's being able to actually apply the education that I've been taught uh, throughout Brown. So being able to work on a startup in B-Lab has been really integral to my Brown experience as a whole. We access the broader business and entrepreneurial community and actually a lot of Brown alums with a focus on striving to find people with sector expertise. We're meeting with people talking to us and telling us this is how it feels like starting up a company, so get ready, it's going to get you know, rough, it's going to get tough. So actually having this, this, these discussions with our mentors um, is actually quite helpful. It's a thought process, it's a way of approaching problems, it's a way of solving problems. And so at Brown, I think it's vital really, teaching and learning and allowing students to experience entrepreneurship. I look at these programs, I feel like it's an investment on into us as students that we hope to invest back into the lives of other people. So it's like a gift that keeps on giving, you know, constantly. Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming. We appreciate your enthusiastic response to the opportunity to come and see B-Lab and, and to see that exciting video. That just came out this morning and we're very, very proud of our, of our stars. I don't know about you, but it sort of stole all of my main talking points, so I don't really have a lot to say. Although the old guy in the white shirt really got me excited. I don't know about you, but that, was, that really got me going. I'm very happy to, to welcome uh, an institution in entrepreneurship, Baird Hazeltine, right on the front row. Thank you so much for coming, Baird. And we're also proud to welcome Provost Locke, who is uh, an entrepreneur in his own right and a big booster of entrepreneurship at Brown and B-Lab in particular. Thank you, Rick. My name is Jason Harry. I'm an associate professor of the practice in the School of Engineering, and I'm honored to be the director of B-Lab last year and this, uh, this past concluding summer. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you guys tonight uh, this uh, group of brilliant entrepreneurs. They started as historians, as scientists, as policy wonks, as mathematicians, biologists, and after eight weeks in B-Lab, we count them now as entrepreneurs in their own right. You may have seen the, the description of B-Lab as an immersive, eight-week experiential program, and all of that's true, and we're proud of all of those attributes. 
What we see B-Lab being is a critical bridge between sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the theory and practicing entrepreneurship to really doing entrepreneurship. There's a big, big difference in our mind between thinking about it and doing it. And that's what B-Lab's about. We sort of bridge the gap, frankly, between uh, academic entrepreneurship and the big world of, of commercial incubators, accelerators. Our goal is to support the ventures uh, as they sort of gain their balance. They've been working on projects sometimes for years before they come into B-Lab, sometimes for weeks and months, and different ones have different preparedness for the B-Lab experience. Some of them are fully balanced on two wheels and proceeding along admirably. Others are a little shaky with the steering wheel, and, and we sort of trot alongside them to keep them from falling over and skinning their knees. But at the end of B-Lab, they're all really on, you know, they're, they're fully balanced and moving forward in a beautiful, beautiful fashion. The B-Lab uh, mentors are a key, key part of the B-Lab experience. You saw the students talk about that. And in fact, we had 40 plus mentors, advisors, uh, service providers who came in and worked with the students over that time. And we asked one of our lead mentors to come and speak to you tonight about being a B-Lab mentor from the, from the mentor's perspective. I'd like to introduce, introduce Deb Mill Schofield. She's a, yep, thank you. <laughs> Deb is an entrepreneur in her own right, a founder, an investor, a teacher, uh, and, and uh, a mentor that Brown University turns to again and again. She's an alum of an unknown year in the early 80s. <laughs> Uh, and we're so, we're so grateful to you as a representative of all the mentors, many of whom are in the room tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. So yeah, in here it says I'm class of 82 and 83. So I'm actually, I came in as 83 and somebody said to me, oh, you can't graduate from Brown in three years. And you know, I'm a Brown kid, right? So hey, all right. Um, they wanted me to talk about mentoring here at Brown and B-Lab. So for the last five years or so, I've probably mentored over about 100 students. Right now, actively about 35 current alum and undergrads. I try to get up here a lot to do that. And most of the community at Brown thinks I do it because it's just like such a generous, wonderful thing I do. Um, but actually, it is an integral part of my business model because I mentor for three specific reasons. Number one, it keeps me learning more than it will with my clients. It is like grad school for free. Second, it is a way to keep me nimble, agile, mentally able to pivot on a dime, having to challenge my core assumptions and beliefs, which then also helps me do that in the world. And third, frankly, is love. And that may be a surprise to some of you, but the depth of mutual love, admiration and respect, as I look at one of them, um, with my mentees is frankly indescribable. And so as you all alumni are out there, if you are out there, I wanna highly encourage you to go and mentor Brown University kids. First of all, you will be so glad you don't have to compete with them to get in, and you got in when you did, because you wouldn't now. <laughs> Thank God. Um, second, you, as, as selfish as this may sound, it's the fact, you will not understand until you do it the depth of what you get back and what you learn. And if you want these young kids to go on and do cool things in the world, then be a part of making that happen and don't sit back and complain about it, but go out there and make it happen. So I've mentored several of these kids, past B-Labs, I hope present B-Labs. It is an amazing experience for them to focus on that solely instead of that and classes and try to balance. And I think it is a gift that we're able to give those students as we raise them up for the next few years. So thanks guys and you're gonna kill it.
Thanks so much, Deb. Really appreciate it. And again, she's a representative, really, for a, an amazing array of mentors who help these guys. Uh, we really strive, uh, and I think this is a bit unique, to try to find sector-specific expertise. And so we, uh, we mine uh, such uh, tools as LinkedIn and the advancement group here at Brown to find people who have an affinity for the university, who believe in the educational mission of the university and the educational component of entrepreneurship. And, and as Deb said, they're, they're, uh, they get extremely engaged and excited to participate. Well, we don't mess around at B-Lab Pitch Night. We're going to jump right into the pitches. Uh, just to set a little bit of context, these are not what you would consider classic investor pitches. And so they're going to be things that you might, if you've seen investor pitches, they're going to be things that you would expect to see in an investor pitch that you will not see tonight. You won't see hockey stick revenue curves. You won't see uh, deep competitive analysis. You won't see hiring plans. You won't see use of proceeds and all of that kind of stuff. But what you will see is a very clear exposition of a high impact unmet need somewhere in the world, and I mean throughout the world, a clear uh, hypothesis for a solution and an action plan to carry it forward. So the way this is going to go, we have all of our ventures uh, lined up here. There's going to be a little bit of baton passing of microphones and so forth, so bear with us. We're going to synchronize the, uh, the video with the, uh, with the uh, folks, and we're just going to power through them. We have 11 ventures tonight. Uh, I welcome you to applaud them uh, as they exit, and we're just going to get going. First up is Vishnu. Neurosurgery is the area that Vishnu is working in. And in that enterprise, it's super, super important to be accurate. And so he's working on a technology that really will make neurosurgery safer and faster. Well, thank you, Jason, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. My name is Vishnu Dantu. I'm a student here at Brown studying applied math and biology. I'm leading a team of surgeons and engineers at Brown to build the third eye of neurosurgery. With their hands in the brain, Neurosurgeons are effectively blind during brain tumor removal surgery. Uh, neurosurgeons have a really difficult task of differentiating between tumorous tissue and normal tissue throughout a 9 to 12 hour very long surgery. And right now, there's no effective continuous visualization technique to allow surgeons to actually localize these brain tumor regions with good spatial resolution. Uh, I'm going to present you uh, three best practices that neurosurgeons actually use right now. So the first technique is uh, actually called MRI. Neurosurgeons use MRI images from the day before, yesterday, to guide them with surgeries they're doing today. But when they remove the skull and when they're progressing with their surgery, brain matter shifts. And that image from the day before is completely obsolete. Now, the second method is called fluorescence imaging, and neurosurgeons will actually inject a dye uh, to uh, highlight the brain tumor. So the brain tumor will glow, but the problem with this technique is there's no specificity at the boundaries of these tumors. So neurosurgeons still have a difficult time understanding where the tumor region actually ends and where the normal tissue begins. Okay, now I want to prepare you guys for the next technique I'm about to talk about. Um, it's, it'll be kind of shocking for, for all of you. And neurosurgeons actually prefer this technique to the previous two I just mentioned. Um, and I want to give a trigger warning. This concept I'm about to show you is a little graphic. It's called awake brain surgery. So neurosurgeons, in some cases, actually prefer to keep patients awake throughout a 9 to 12 hour surgery. And let's say the tumor is located in a part of the brain that's involved in motor function. So they'll have the patient actively uh, doing a, an activity throughout the 9 to 12 hour surgery. In this case, it's strumming a guitar. And when the patient can no longer strum, that's when the neurosurgeon knows he or she has taken too much normal tissue. And this is, this is completely traumatizing for patients. Um, and these are really the three best practices that neurosurgeons use to visualize tumor regions with, good, with, uh, with any spatial resolution. Uh, and from this, it, it really exhibits that neurosurgeons are effectively operating blind during surgery. And as they're working on the most important part of the body, the human brain, it's not just nice to have, it's actually essential for them to have a continuously updated visualization system to, local, to locate these tumor regions. 
This is predictive optics. We've built an image, image, imaging system along with a proprietary image processing software to first map absolute blood vessel flow and structural properties, and from these properties actually highlight tumor regions via augmented reality. So on the left, on the left this is the first iteration of our product. It consists of a CCD camera along with uh, a laser source that actually propagates six, 650 nanometer light onto uh, a large field of view within the brain. Uh, and on the right, there's an image from our image, uh, image, imaging hardware um, that actually gives neurosurgeons this visualization of absolute blood flow and tumor regions uh, via augmented reality. So we are primarily a software company. Um, there are leading surgical microscope companies and robotics companies such as Leica, Zeiss, and Intuitive Surgical, um, but we are not competing with them. So we're planning on licensing our hardware to these companies, uh, and this hardware will attach, this imaging hardware will attach to already existing microscopes uh, in surgical ORs. And this hardware will come with the base software of just absolute blood flow visualization. But the bulk of our revenue will actually come from the hospital system. So hospital systems will pay us for a more advanced image processing software um, for tumor localization along with aneurysm localization and later on epileptic region localization. We're firstly focused on the New England area, which has a $100 million uh, market size. We're later looking to expand to the greater United States um, with 5,700 hospitals, and that market size is around $3 billion. But the great thing about this technology is it's not just limited to neurosurgery. So surgical oncologists can actually use this visualization tool to localize a tumor on your liver. Fetal surgeons can insert this imaging device into a 60 micrometer uh, uh, incision and actually visualize uh, abnorm abnormalities with absolute blood flow in a child that has not been born yet. I have a great team uh, of advisors at Brown University. My lead, uh, my lead advisor, Dr. Zhongwan Li, is actually in the audience right now. Um, he's, he's given me a lot of inf ins uh, inspiration over the last year, um, and he's given a lot of great support and guidance. Uh, I also have a couple of clinical advisors at Rhode Island Hospital who have, who have given me good support. And over the summer, the B-Lab staff, uh, Jason, Liz, um, have really helped me uh, uh, with the business development of this venture. Now, we're right now focused on animal testing. In the next three to four months, we're looking to start clinical testing. At that point, uh, we'll be needing a seed round of uh, around $500,000. So I'd love to speak to any of you who are interested after this presentation. Um, our uh, visualization technology is really the foundation for a concept called autonomous robotic surgery. And this is really exciting for, for all of us at Predictive Optics. So our visualization tool will allow for an unprecedented amount of uh, data collection during surgery on the structural and molecular properties that are constantly changing. And if we can collect all this data and uh, train neural networks, train robots on the best surgical techniques, best surgical practices that lead to the best outcomes during surgery, we can create the future of autonomous surgery. Uh, this technology is the future of surgery. Thank you. Thanks, Vishnu. Great job. Our next uh, venture is working on arguably one of the most pernicious problems that's vexing society today. It's, it's unreliable information in the news media, sometimes called fake news. These guys are approaching it from a highly scientific and algorithmic approach, and we're really proud of their progress. Hi everybody, I'm Jay. I'm a senior concentrating in computational biology here at Brown, and I'm the CEO at Crosscheck. So the problem we're dealing with at Crosscheck is one, like Jason said, I'm sure you're all familiar with, and that is a problem of fake news. So we all read news articles on the internet, but sometimes we're exposed to content that's less reputable. Why, actually just the other day, you know, I was scrolling through my Facebook news feed, and I noticed that there was an article which mentioned that North Korea had actually launched a nuclear missile at Hawaii. Of course, you know, it wasn't true, but this sort of content has caused a distrust in the media. And the problem of fake news extends beyond just a distrust in the media. It's caused, you know, political mayhem, and it can even alter the course of elections. 
So we're actually taking an algorithmic approach to solving this problem. So let's say you're on the New York Times, you're reading this article about you know, uh, the Republicans and uh, they're apparently coming out with a tax plan soon. So Crosscheck is a Chrome extension and you can see that we assigned this article a score of 97. That means the text, there was a 97% probability that the text of this article matched up with a lot of similar articles published the same day. So if we click the view details button and uh, we scroll down, we can actually see uh, 14 articles talking about the same exact thing. So now we're gonna go to another website and here we see, you know, oh, Barack Obama's real identity, something I think we're all really enthusiastic about learning about. So, you know, we're scrolling and reading through this article and what does Crosscheck predict the score for this article is? Let's take a look. So this actually gets a cross-check score of zero, which means uh, I guess Barack Obama's identity isn't what they thought it was. So uh, everybody asks, how does this magic work? So you know, at a very high level, in real time, right now while we're speaking, we're sourcing thousands and thousands of news articles to our servers. For each of these articles, we extract key text, you know, quotes, statistics, facts, and numbers. And then we use those to group articles into groups of similar articles, cl clusters of similar articles. Then let's say you're reading something new, be it you know, a blog post, a Facebook post, or a news article, or some other content. We see what's the probability that this content falls into one of the predefined clusters we've created. So how is Crosscheck a business? So first, we've highly optimized our server costs. You know, all of the thousands and thousands of articles we're scraping is actually done for a fixed cost because we actually outsource that to another company. For just a few thousand dollars more per month, we can actually support millions of users on our platform. Now, in order to monetize the Chrome extension, people can start using the Chrome extension for free. Once they run out of queries, they can subscribe for just one dollar per month. And once we reach a critical mass of users, we'll look into monetizing the valuable user data we're collecting. In order to acquire customers, we're using traditional streams, such as you know, Facebook advertising and AdWords, but we're also looking to allowing individuals to share the cross-check score on social media, which we think could result in a viral proposition, a viral explosion of cross-check. So, you know, right now we have our Chrome extension, we've released our private beta, and we've actually had a very significant conversion of individuals to the paying user tier. After we release on mobile, we plan on creating our next software, Crosscheck Journalism, which is actually a pre-publication content verification tool for journalists. So before they publish a news article, they can see what other outlets are talking about this news article and how does this context fit into the broader context that's being published. After that, we plan on moving on to our next product, Crosscheck PR. This will allow everybody from you know, small businesses to large enterprises to, to determine from the millions and millions of blog posts, news articles, comment threads being published every day, is there less reputable content being published about their specific business? So we have a very strong team of individuals from Brown, Hofstra, and RISD, and we're also working with John Klein, the former president of CNN, who's actually in the audience today. So we filed a 21-page provisional patent application for our algorithm with some of the top legal counsel in the world, and today we're, uh, we've already raised tens of thousands in our convertible note round. We're looking for a lead investor for a seed round uh, of $1 million, but more importantly than the money, we're looking for key partners in the news and media industry who will help us develop Crosscheck into the global standard for content verification. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you at our table where we'll have a live demo set up. Thanks again. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Universities, uh, especially in America, are these days becoming overwhelmed trying to service the mental health needs of their students. 
And sometimes students themselves are a little reluctant to even call on the, the help of the institution they're attending. Uh, Project Let's is a venture that's been working for several years really on this, on this issue and has a really innovative solution for it. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Kaufman. I'm the founder and executive director of Project Let's. I live with OCD and major depressive disorder. I'm a sexual assault survivor as well as a suicide attempt survivor. Hi everyone, my name is Molly Haas and I'm the director of expansion of Project Let's. I also live with OCD as well as ADHD and major depressive disorder. So, so Project Let's is a nonprofit organization aiming to create an inclusive community for folks with mental illness through three main pathways peer support services, advocacy efforts, and political change. So the problem that we are aiming to address is the fact that university um, counseling centers are overwhelmed, overburdened, and have extremely long wait times. Um, and rates of mental illness among college students today are also at an all-time high. Um, even when the, the resources are there and available to students, many students aren't using them. Um, for a multitude of reasons, one of which is internalized stigma. Mental illnesses are highly stigmatized, especially among um, specific communities, and um, that stigma can be internalized and can prevent somebody from wanting to claim that mentally ill identity. Additionally, um, there is a general suspicion of the healthcare industry, whether it will actually help students, um, as well as a mistrust of university resources and fear of being kicked out of school for being mentally ill. Universities also have a unique conflict of interest between supporting students, supporting the community, and supporting their own interest in terms of liability and, and PR concerns, which led to our four-year model of the Peer Mental Health Advocate Program, which we call PMHAs. At its core, we train students with lived experience of mental illness, trauma, and disability to provide peer support services. Our model and curriculum comes from certified peer recovery specialist trainings that are state mandated, and we fill the patient provider gap on campuses and in the community. In addition, we're co-empowering both the peer and the peer mental health advocate to take care of each other and support each other in really unique and beneficial ways. And what does peer support mean? First and foremost, we are not pseudotherapists. We do not claim to provide therapy. We provide a specific type of support in the mental health care system and only operate from our own lived experience and from our own training. We focus on one-on-one -on -one care, advocacy services, crisis response, and linking students to on- and off-campus resources. Additionally, um, informal peer support is already happening behind closed doors by students who don't have training and um, often don't, have never been um, exposed to issues of mental health before. So what we're doing is we're formalizing that system of care and ensuring that the person who is providing it is qualified to do so. Um, so these are some statistics about our work at Brown. Um, as you can see, something that's notable is that over half of the students that use our program and have a PMHA have stayed with that particular PMHA for a year or more, um, which is longer than many of these students may be able to see a mental health provider. In addition, Project Let's on Campus has been the first responder to three university crises, including suicides on campus, in which we provided safe spaces for students and the ability for students to congregate and have spaces of healing and discussion. So our core difference is that our model is through the, uh, the social model of disability, which is championed by the disability community. This stands in comparison to the medical model of disability, which really places mental illness as a pathologized um, experience within our bodies. But the social model of disability is looking at social and environmental barriers that lead to our, our experiences as, as disabled and mentally ill folks. So for example, as a sexual assault survivor, I don't always feel comfortable uh, with the diagnosis of PTSD. Um, how can we say that there's something wrong with me when something wrong has happened to me? Um, and as this slide states, this wasn't built for me. Many of the students we work with have expressed this sentiment. At Brown, we work with many sexual assault survivors who do not wish to or have not been able to seek justice through traditional pathways. These survivors come to PMHAs for support in not just navigating the experience of being a survivor, but the difficulties in navigating a system that is so often set up for their failure and an institution that betrays them. Specifically, if you are a woman, if you are disabled, if you are black, 
if you are indigenous, if you are Asian, if you are Latinx, or you do not have the money for a provider or a team of attorneys. And outside of these systems, students are at the forefront of change. They always have been. Three years ago, students led a semester-long protest called Money Talks at Brown, covered by Democracy Now!, criticizing the prioritization of money and legacy over justice for survivors. The existence of these protests indicate that students do not trust these systems of care and they don't trust these institutions. So we can argue back and forth all day as to whether or not they should trust them, but the fact of the matter is, as of right now and until they are improved, they don't and they need an alternate um, system of care that they can turn to. In terms of early funding, we've been incredibly grateful to have the Embark Fellowship through Brown University. We're currently finalists in the Rodenberry Fellowship and are working with incredible organizations such as the Mary Christie Foundation and Peace Love Studios. These are also other organizations that we've worked with in the past, including the Jed Foundation, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the Steve Fund, and Seven Cups of Tea, all of which do very unique work in this sphere. Um, but again, we are um, unique in that we are providing long-term one-on-one peer support services. So as I said earlier, I'm the founder and executive director of Project Let's. I've built the curricular and training model for the PMHA program that was piloted at Brown. And I also focus on executive strategy as well as sustainability and funding for the organization. And I'm the director of expansion. I'm responsible for overseeing the 13 schools that will now be implementing the PMHA program within the next year. We come to this work from really personal approaches. During my freshman year at Brown, I had a severe self-harm episode in which instead of choosing to seek supports on campuses, I decided to scotch tape part of my leg together um, and, and risk severe infection so that I wouldn't be kicked out of Brown. And while that may seem like an extreme example, I work with students every day who've dealt with that and far worse in order to remain Brown students and keep that identity. And it's also incredibly personal for me as well. My sophomore year at Brown, I was seeing a psychiatrist who put me on a medication that um, gave me extreme side effects and also eventually made me have suicidal thoughts for the first time in my life. Every time that I brought up these issues with him, he increased the dose and told me that the therapeutic effect was just not happening yet. Um, and if I didn't have peer supporters around me who told me what a, an ideal relationship with a provider looked like, I would not have known that I should not stay in that relationship with that provider, that it wasn't my fault that I wasn't responding to the medication, and that I deserved a different doctor who would be willing to switch me to a different pill. Um, these are the schools that we are very excited to expand to in the next year. All of them will be developing pure mental health advocate programs. In addition to working with four-year universities, we're also focused on expanding to communities that don't have access to higher education. So this fall, October 6th through 9th, we're hosting our inaugural conference at Brown University, building peer support services in university mental health care systems, and our co-sponsors of the Mary Christie Foundation and Peace Love Studios. At this conference, we hope to bring together students, administrators, and providers to discuss concrete solutions to ableism in academia and how we can support students with mental illness, what those students identify as their needs. Um, we view this conference as a critical launching pad for this student-led movement for disability justice and for mental health. We're currently looking for workshop and speaker sponsors for our conference, so if you're interested, please feel free to talk with us. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks, guys. Our next venture is Che. You met Joyce in the video, and all I can say is if you think there's no room in the food industry for another product, you're wrong, and you're going to have to race me to their table after the event to taste their wonderful product. Thanks, Joyce. Hi, I'm Joyce in the flesh. Um, I'm a student, I'm a graduate student here at Brown, Biomedical Biotechnology, and I'm here to introduce our startup, Che. Che is a food startup which focuses on the healthy snack sector. And earlier this year, one of our co-founders got diagnosed with anemia. 
and she was trying to incorporate healthier snacking options into her diet, but she couldn't find any. Just like anemia, there are other health conditions that are tied to poor nutrition. And there, as a result of this connections, there have been an increasing trend towards healthier eating across all demographics. When we took a look at the snack sector, we realized that there are three attributes that snack companies usually go for. Low calories, great taste, and high nutrition. But currently, the snack sector has failed to meet these three attributes. Usually when you go for high nutrition, you find ancient grains, and they usually lack in taste. And when you go for fruits and vegetables, which are really great tasting, they lack in high nutrients, and they're usually high calorie. And when you go for your sweet snacks, it's usually packed with a lot of calories, and sometimes they have chemical fillers to bring down the calorie content. And Che provides a solution by combining Asian grains with fruits and vegetables to provide a sweet, low-calorie snack. So, in our ingredients, we have health, in our recipe, we have healthy ingredients. We have non-traditional ingredients, which means you never find a potato or corn in our products. And we design each flavor bearing in mind the consumer's health and nutritional needs. In our sugar content, for a serving of Che, which is 20 Che treats, you get 2.3 grams of sugar. While for a regular Tate's cookie, you get nine grams of sugar. And for a serving of Oreo, which are three cookies, you get 14 grams of sugar. Now let's take a look at what 2.3 grams of sugar will get you in Oreo and Tate's. That. You get half an Oreo, you get two thirds of a Tate cookie, and you get 20 Che treats. With calorie content, we also win because a serving size of Che, which is 20, you get 83 calories. For a serving size of Tate, you get 210 calories. And for a serving size of Oreo, you get 160 calories. And now we're going down to ingredients. So these three products claim to have quinoa in their products. So now we're going to see if that is true. I don't know, a lot of you are familiar with Where's Waldo? We're going to play a little game called Where's the Quinoa? And if you look at the ingredients, you will see that when you look at late July, you see the organic quinoa is the second to the last ingredient on the list. When you look at Back to Nature, the quinoa is right after an emulsifier, which is interesting. And when you look at Che, we keep quinoa first. And these are the product labels, so they probably say that they're quinoa, just so you know. <laughs> and these are customer testimonials. And and I'm just going to let you be a judge for the taste. After this, you can meet us outside and try some of our products. For distribution, we already have um, two sales agreements with Eastside Mart and Coffee Exchange. We're trying to start local so we can build our base and then go up from there. For a scale-up plan, the first phase is for local and the second phase regional. The third phase, we're going to local supermarkets online. And for the fourth phase, we're going for supermarket distributors and coffee franchises. These, my, these, this is a dedicated team, myself, Daniela, Connor, and Nathan. And these are our advisors who have been so helpful. And also, we want to say a great thank you to B-Lab. And what's next? Right now, we're raising, we're raising seed funding for customer acquisition and expansion. Also feel free to talk to us at our table after this. I'm sure a lot of you would love to try the snacks. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. The next uh, venture is working in the realm of virtual reality. It's a technology that seems to always get about ready to go. It's really starting to take off now, but there are some critical technological missing links that these guys are trying to solve. Thanks, Jason, for that, and thank you to all of you for being here today. My name is Ethan. This is my partner, Bell. We are the co-founders of Taptronics, a virtual reality hardware startup trying to make immersion in VR affordable for everyone using a glove controller and force feedback. So VR has been a cornerstone of science fiction for decades. Think of the holodeck from Star Trek, the Matrix from the Matrix, a <laughs> hyper-realistic, computer-generated environment where you can go anywhere, do anything, be anyone. And this setup here is the closest thing we have today to that, where the, sight, the screen and the sounds are so realistic that you can feel really immersed in a virtual environment. 
And for those kinds of things, it works pretty well. But the problem is here. Once you're in that environment, that virtual reality, you're supposed to get sucked in. The only way you can interact with it is with, the, with these controllers, uh, some, a stick with some buttons on it. Now, this works OK if you want to pick up some objects in a game, or shoot a gun, or swing a sword. But let's say you want to control the movement of a basketball, or play, play the piano. In order to do these things realistically, you have to have a detailed control, a detailed feedback that these standard controllers just can't provide. The vibrational feedback that they give it doesn't really hold up to having an object in your hand, closing it around, and feeling that object push back on you. Talk a little more about how we're going to try and we're turning this idea, this dream, into more of a concrete thing. I'll pass it off to my partner, Bell, here. Hi, everyone. So we have went around and talked to more than 50 VR users around Providence and in Boston. And we have confirmed that they want better immersion of VR. But the problem is, Alternative glove controller are too expensive. Look at this number. At button controller, you have something that's called around one hundred dollar. But moving up, you have vibration feedback glove, which costs six hundred to one thousand two hundred. And look up again at force feedback glove controller, it's twelve thousand dollar. Who could afford that? So we have got some insight about why these glove controller are so expensive. So if you look at this graph between realism and cost, button controller is at the bottom left of the graph. So it's not realistic, but the cost of making it is low. So as we move up to 20 degree of freedom, which is how we move our hand, or arm, tra or arm tracking, or texture, or force, sensi or force sensitivity. So by trying to replicate the human movement, the cost go up exponentially. So where Taptronics is, Taptronic, we try to achieve the local and finger hand tracking and binary force feedback, which be we believe is a basic feature to have in glove controller. We are aiming for 50% realism and 10% cost. So right now we have a, a video of our prototype that Ethan made. So you see that as Ethan moves finger around, the VR hand moves accordingly. And as he grabs the object, you see that the model moves and the string will pull back his finger and offering false feedback. And next is a photo of our prototype. On the left one is the prototype you already seen in the video. And on the right one is the prototype we made, the second iteration, which we try to make it smaller, wireless, and reduce the degree of complexity of the glove controller so that we can maintain the car to be affordable. So who is our customer? Our customer is we are users who are frustrated with the lack of immersiveness of VR. And we are designer who is looking for a new tool to create a content. So our market size, according to Glee Live uh, VR market report, the market size this year is at $7.2 billion. This includes both hardware and software. However, when we look into the number of hardware, which is HTC Oculus and um, HTC so we see that the number of VR accessory market is about $210 million. But many experts agree that within the next three years, the market of VR will grow so high, and the market of VR accessory will go up to $1.3 billion in 2020. So our team include me. So I am a recent graduate from uh, Innovation Management and Entrepreneurship Program at Brown with a background in business development. And Ethan, his experience in building cutlet prototypes and building a hand prosthetic. Our advisor include Benjamin Resnick. He's uh, currently an AR designer at IBM. And Anthony Marshall, he has more than 10 years experience in building a hardware product. And our business advisor include uh, Jason Harry and Matt Pillar. Both of them has extensive experience in coaching many startups. So after four months of hard work in B-Lab, we have identified that there's a big opportunity in the VR market. However, we also come across many challenges in the VR industry. We came across a lot of technical challenges. And this is a very crowded market. Everybody Facebook, Microsoft are aiming to jump into this market. So we are looking to talk to experts in the industry. So if any one of you would like to share the insight in this industry, please come to us at the event. 
And also, lastly, we want to thank you, B Lab, and community. We are community in Boston, in Providence, and at Bow, including Tom Oda, who gave us a lot of feedback for the project. Thank you so much. If you've ever been injured, if you've ever had to undergo surgery, you've often probably been shunted off to physical therapy, and you've also experienced the horrors of trying to do the physical therapy when you're at home. It's a very complicated uh, prospect, and these two entrepreneurs are working to solve that problem. Thank you, Jason, for that, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Is it? OK. Hi, I'm Jillian. I'm Lauren. And we are a Keso, a digital health startup empowering the Physical Therapeutic Alliance. So both Lauren and I are athletes, and as a result, we went through many years of physical therapy during high school. And one of the most important parts of physical therapy is the at-home exercises, or HEPs. These are basically the homework assignments that therapists give to patients in order to encourage a more 24-7 healing process. They produce longer-lasting results and ensure a faster process. Lauren was a star student, always did her exercises, and improved really quickly with long-lasting results. I, on the other hand, was like the rest of the patients. I never really did my exercises and couldn't really find the motivation to schedule it into my daily life. As a result, I still feel pain today. Even running up the hill to this presentation today, I felt pain in my knees. And not only did I waste many years of physical therapy, I also produced really disappointing results for my therapist. So over the summer, we talked to patients, therapists, and advisors to get a better understanding of different challenges in the physical therapy industry. And we came to three main pain points. The first one is the HEP database itself. Therapists spend typically around five minutes per patient to pull up and create a HEP. This is because they have to find specific exercises and kind of puzzle piece together these programs. Um, and while five minutes per patient may not seem like a lot, they typically see around 12 to 20 patients a day, and that means they're wasting at least an hour of their workday just putting together these HEPs. The second one is documentation. This is the paperwork that therapists put together for their insurance companies in order to get reimbursement, aka get paid. Um, and it's a very repetitive and tedious process, and they waste a lot of the time that they could be spending with their patients. The last one is patient compliance. So again, patients like me um, who don't do their exercises. If you think about it like this, patients go in for around three hours of sessions per week. What about the rest of the time? If they're not spending at least some portion of their time at home working on their exercises, then they're losing a lot of progress and not producing long-lasting results. And just to give a better representation, this is the current industry standard for HEPs. Um, so after therapists go through the hassle of actually putting together these exercises, patients are given these really confusing and hard to navigate worksheets. They're kind of like origami instructions. I have no idea what the guy in the lower right is trying to tell me to do. So after looking through all of these issues, we came up with a queso. Uh, so with ACASO, uh, we are solving two solutions, one for the therapist and one for the patients. Uh, for the therapist, we have a web application that will streamline uh, the patient profiles and have a database for HEPs uh, so that they can quickly assign HEPs to their patients, thereby saving them time and letting them use that time to work with the patients, what, what they actually want to do. We also have data analytics uh, that will be able to show what exercises the patients actually complete. And this proves to be critical for the documentation process because pa um, therapists will be able to say concretely, this is what a patient needs to work on, this is what they need to do, and this is why I'm assigning XYZ assign um, exercises. There's also um, patient reminders to you know, tell them to actually complete their HEPs, and this overall will help the compliance uh, issue with, with patients in, in completing their, their exercises. And of course, the patients also benefit. There is a mobile application that uh, patients will be able to use uh, to communicate with their therapists. So if they had any questions that usually eat up on the clinical session times, it can be streamlined through this application. There's also a more intuitive um, display of the home exercise programs. So instead of seeing those documents of those you know, wonderful, great instructions and pictures, they can actually see videos and more contextual um, instructions that will, be more, that will be easier for the patients to actually follow. There's also um, 
a progress tracker so that patients can uh, see how they are improving uh, throughout their physical therapy. So the market that we are in um, is growing, and uh, right now uh, for physical therapy softwares um, in the private industry for private clinics is $149 million. Um, but this only increases as we move into the public sector more for like hospitals, um, and again it increases as we go to the world, which is 13 and a half, over $13.5 billion. Um, but this again is only for physical therapy. Uh, ECESO has applications in speech therapy and, and occupational therapy, stuff just beyond physical therapy. So the market size actually is a little bit, you know, much, much larger uh, than what we have here. And with a CAGR of 10%, um, this market's only intended to grow. So looking at what exists out there right now, we have companies that focus on HEP, communication, and data analytics, but nothing that really binds them all together. And the busy lives of physical therapists, they have to manage all three of these different um, systems in their separate, in separate companies. So what Kesso does is bridges all these together and creates an all-in-one package that will allow physical therapists to easily do all three of these things easily from one platform. And so why are we the team to do this? Uh, Jillian is a student at RISD studying industrial design. I'm a student at Brown studying computer science. Uh, and together we, we cover both the, um, the design and the technical um, range that can see this project to fruition. We're also working with over a dozen physical therapists in the Boston and Providence area who give, help us give um, a front and back uh, or understanding of the physical therapy industry. So we have experience in both patients and physical therapist sides of view. So what we're looking for today are any contacts within physical therapy or anyone who's in insurance uh, to help continue our research within this project, as well as people who um, are, are familiar with, with video making so we can help create our HEP database and beta testers for uh, our actual product. Um, we are, I guess so thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please come up to us at the table and we'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, guys. The next venture is another medical uh, uh, technology. Uh, you would think that when patients are in the hospital, they, there's a one-way track to getting better. But all too often, it happens that they actually can significantly and suddenly deteriorate. Uh, uh, Chang is going to describe a technology from the Massachusetts General Hospital and how it could keep that from happening. Thank you, Jason, for your introduction. Hello, uh, my name is Chen Liu, co-founder of STA Technology. I'm very glad to present you with this business opportunity, BP Flex. The problem we are trying to solve is for patients in hospital. Too often, they fail into serious deteriorations that may lead to a transfer to ICU or even a death. And 40% of these deteriorations, according to studies, are caused by care personnel missing important clinic events, such as showing up here, such as sepsis, acute hypo and hypertension, acute cardiac events. And the reason why we missed these important events is because the key identifier, the blood pressure, is only measured intermittently. There are currently ways to measure blood pressure. The blood pressure cuff, I believe everyone is familiar with it, but it's impractical to detect adverse events because it's intermittent. And on the other hand, the arterial catheter, which is accurate and it does continuous measurement. However, is, um, because it's invasive, it's too expensive to uh, be deployed in such departments and uh, uh, it brings in rare but serious complications. Here is our solution, BPFlex, a device that's wearable and allows non-invasive continuous ambulatory blood pressure monitoring with the same arterial waveform quality as an invasive airline. And this allows physicians to collect data of your blood pressure uh, during uh, physical therapy and daily activities. And uh, with data connected to the hospital's backend system, the nurses will be alerted if something happens and some action is required. To demonstrate how powerful our core technology is, I would like to compare it to the data from invasive arterial catheter. With the invasive airline, you typically you can get the pulsation of the blood pressure bit by bit. And we can get the same level of data quality with our non-invasive technology, superficial temporary artery 
tonometry, which is uh, measure the pressure here. You can feel the pulsation even with your finger. Um, and another aspect is we can capture the influence of your daily activities on the blood pressure when the subject is moving around. Our goal is to create a solution that's low cost enough to be deployed in every hospital bed in the US, in the medical surgical units and step down units. And there are 800,000 of these in hospital beds. And we think this is going to benefit uh, uh, 40 million patients annually in the US. We have achieved uh, functional prototypes in our lab, uh, and it's accurate. We have attracted a uh, lot of uh, industry, uh, industry interest. Bose and Alog devices are our partners for early development and product design. We also presented this uh, prototype to NIH, to Harvard Med School, and to Brown ER, and get some good uh, testimonials. Uh, also, we are proud to announce that we are a Pulse at Mass Challenge alumni. Uh, top 30 ventures from the 450 applicants worldwide. Here's our brand team. Our team uh, is led by Dr. Chen Zhang, uh, who is the director of Mass General System, uh, Mass General Hospital Neural System Group. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience designing medical devices and uh, algorithms. Our, Nin, uh, our CEO, Ning, is a brilliant uh, BME engineer, and, and I'm Chang. I just graduated from Bronze Chemistry PhD program with secondary masters in Prime. Um, yes, uh, and we believe the future of blood pressure monitoring is continuous, non-invasive ambulatory, and we are we are the right team to make it happen. And we're glad to uh, talk to you after the event. Thank you. Thanks, Chang. These days, uh, social media and 24-7 uh, internet allows customers for, of companies to do all kinds of random violence. They can complain, they can post, they can do all kinds of things uh, that, that in an effort to communicate back to the, to the company can actually uh, create great risk for the company. Wovion is a startup company that's working to help companies deal with that challenge. Hi, I'm Jake Miller, I'm a senior at Brown. And I'm Adam Rowett, a senior at the University of Pennsylvania. And we're the co-founders of Wovion, a smarter way for businesses to have conversations online. So Adam and I met doing consulting work in Australia last summer. Um, and what we did is we went to small and medium-sized businesses uh, that were struggling to find new customers. And we gave them new digital strategies, such as social media, uh, digital advertisement, and SEO. We found, though, is no matter how good of a job we did with them, there was still something missing. There was still a problem. Picture Dave's Deals, an e-commerce company. They have a great team, a great supply chain. Their pricing is way below anyone else in the industry. But no matter how many consulting teams they hire or softwares they try, customer loyalty still seems to be a big problem. We come in and we find that Dave's Deals has data fragmentation problems. They're not getting back to customers very fast. And the responses they do give aren't horribly personal. It's killing their bottom line. We looked into this farther, we found out this wasn't an isolated incident. This is part of a larger trend. Behold, the comeback of the valued customer. So back in 2003, uh, as seen from this data produced from Harvard Business Review, brand meant a lot. In fact, it, it represented 20% of, of an enterprise value. But the repeat loyal customers, not so much. But as Social media rose, digital communication, and our addiction to instant, customers started demanding personalized, effective, and very quick responses from companies. So the companies that figured this out and adapted were rewarded. And now it flip-flopped. So in fact, customer value is a significant portion of how we value companies. Brand, not so much anymore. And because of this, We've seen dollar uh, figures follow. 91% of companies with 11 employees or more are using some sort of uh, software just for managing and talking to customers. 64% of companies said engagement with customers was their number one priority in their marketing strategy. And to give you the idea of the dollar amount spent on this problem, in 2017, customer relationship management will be $37 billion. 
a lot of companies have tried to introduce solutions to solve these problems, but the solutions are incomplete or just not up to date with how customers currently act. People talk online in a lot of places, and they want fast responses, fast responses that are personalized to them. And this is really where Wovion takes the cake, because we can introduce all that information when companies talk to their customers and let businesses give super fast personal responses anywhere on the web. So when hundreds of messages are coming into a company, what happens and what Wovion does is a couple things. First, we analyze the text, keywords, phrases, sentence structure, and timing. What we do that is we assign urgency and priority. So with these hundreds of messages, naturally the most important and the most urgent rise to the top. At the same time, Wovion is going into the database and finding similar conversations, not only with this customer, but with other customers that have had similar interactions. So not anymore like our, our current clients used to do, where you're searching for hours and hours researching, uh, how did we deal with this last time? Wovion brings that up into your view and saves that valuable time. Sometimes problems are just more complicated. Let's go into one of our clients, Progress Claim. They do legal, legal paperwork. Dozens of people may interact with a given document and dozens more in the future. It's important for them to know when, where, and why someone interacted with something and if they're going to need more data. Wovion takes care of all these problems. It gives them the views to see when people collaborated with it, why they did, and they can add new data sources in with just a few clicks. To build on this more, this is some work we actually did with Progress Claim. You can see that in addition to our workflow approach, we also have a UI UX first approach. While most CRM tools and other softwares are really complicated to use, conversations appear as simple cards, the same way you'd interact with a Facebook post. Anyone can get online and immediately start talking to their customers. You can also see with the conversations on the left, the data and why, where that data came from is all automatically paired on the right. So agents never have to leave the same view to give a personal and fast response to a customer. So we knew from the start we would need a solid core team to start this. So we have David Din, who has years and years of experience starting companies. He started and exited multiple. Um, and we're really excited about a new CTO we brought on board, a computer science PhD with years of CTO experience in fast uh, growing tech companies. We knew that an all-star team wasn't going to be good enough. We also needed a great advising team. And that's why we've paired up with people like Dennis Chan, with over 13 years of natural language experience. Jimmy He, who architected the network at Riot Games, that's League of Legends if you guys don't know. And David Smith, one of the largest distributors in the Asia Pacific region. We rounded this out with Ryan Benici, the Senior Director of Global Marketing at HubSpot, and before that, Salesforce to help position our product. This team and these advisors helped us get over $10,000 of grants in our home turfs of Penn and Brown, and after that, close a seed round with institutional backing from Rough Draft Ventures, backed by General Catalyst and Angel Investors. Since we launched our private beta with our, our 10 initial users, we've been iterating and making the product ever since. But looking forward to our public launch in October, we're looking for three main things. Development talent, we're always looking to work with the brightest um, that are passionate about this problem. Distribution partners, we want this uh, core technology in the hands of as many people as possible to keep strengthening it. And funding, we're looking to close a $500,000 angel round in the next two months. Um, and anyone interested with more questions, please come up to us and talk. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks. Our next venture is in the realm of what's sometimes called soft goods, but they have hard solutions. We've, uh, uh, as a society, gotten more and more mobile. We're carrying more and more junk around with us, and these guys have a really innovative and beautiful way to deal with that. Hey everyone, I'm Brandon Kim. I am a Masters of Industrial Design student at RISD and I am the co-founder of Brevity. We design and manufacture camera backpacks. So my brother approached me and he was looking for a camera backpack but he couldn't find one that didn't make him look like a dork or made him look like he was carrying $5,000 worth of stuff. Myself being a product geek, I decided I can fix this. I can figure this out. So I dove in, and what I ended up finding was that there was actually a lot of people like Dylan who were looking for a bag with utility and that just looked nice. So I went to my local thrift store, 
and I bought a sewing machine, and I began tearing up old backpacks and putting together new backpacks. And what I found was that the best design was this removable protective insert. It allows for our backpacks to go from a normal backpack and turn into a camera backpack. Our customers also liked it. We loved making great products, but what we realized is that we had to turn this into a business. When we started looking into it, what we found was that it was actually a pretty big market with a lot of passionate people within it. So we launched on Kickstarter, and we raised over $38,000. And then we raised an additional $28,000 in various pitch competitions. And this allowed for us to fund our first backpack on the left. But our customers started reaching out to us and asking, we want more styles. We like what you're doing. So we launched the rucksack in the middle and the roll top on the right. All three feature the same removable insert system. And that insert is interchangeable between all three backpacks, mm -hmm. creating repeat customers. We sell direct to customers via our website. We've sold thousands of bags worldwide. But let me tell you guys how we actually make money. So, as I said before, we sell direct to consumer on our website. We have about 74% margins. And later this year, we'll be moving into wholesale. We're looking to scale, basically. Even though we'll be taking a hit to our margins, losing a few points, we'll be selling to new customers in new markets, and we'll be saving with the volume. We have over 50,000 followers on various social media, and we have a large listserv, which acts as a very steady stream of revenue. We've also been featured in many uh, notable publications, such as USA Today and Gizmodo. As a young company, we also rank on the first page of Google for many important search terms right up against the big guys. This is a very steady stream of revenue here. So this is the team behind Brevity. And we're a really close team. And <laughs> by close, I mean we're brothers. What we found actually was that all three of us brought the various components required for a business. So I'm Brandon. I love product, and that's what I do. Dylan, my brother in the middle, hugging the backpack, does sales and marketing. And the handsome guy on the right is Elliot, who's the business brains behind us all. But even with how close we all are, we couldn't do this without the expertise and experience of other individuals. So we've focused on putting together a very strong mentorship team. For example, we have Luke Sherwin of Casper, who is also a very proud Brown alum. So where are we now and where are we going? Last year, we did 230,000 in revenue. This year, we are projected to do over 800,000 in revenue. That's a lot of backpacks. On Tuesday, we launched the Hadley Collection. It's geared at photographers and the urban commuter. If any of you or your friends are photographers or urban commuters, feel free to check it out on Kickstarter. If not, but you've scaled up a consumer brand, I would love to chat with you afterwards. Thank you. We're often asked where do entrepreneurs come up with their ideas and where do they come up with their solutions to the ideas. Often it comes from a very personal unmet need and that's what you're going to hear about. These are two scientists who actually found the solution or the beginning of the solution in some of their laboratory work here at Brown. Thank you. 
Hello, we are Aletheia. We are a biotechnology startup company currently in the research and development phases of a treatment for menstrual pain. Women have a lot to offer, and here at Aletheia, we believe they should not be held back by something they cannot control. I, like most women, dealt with some pain associated with my period, but sometimes the pain would get to be too much. I reached my breaking point when I had to leave work early because I was in such pain I became physically ill. I was too weak to walk home, so I had a Brown University police officer drive me home. You can imagine it was a pretty awkward ride. But I did some research, and turns out I'm not alone. Up to 25% of women deal with pain so high it interferes with their daily activity. To put this on a larger scale, that's $2 billion lost in productivity for women not being able to show up to work or not being able to perform at their highest because they're in pain. And when women are faced with this pain, they only have a limited number of options. They could take the homeopathic route, but that simply isn't sufficient for the majority of women. Instead, they're forced to resort to taking over-the-counter, orally delivered pain medications, such as Advil or Aleve. These medications work by entering through the stomach, being metabolized by the liver, and reaching the intestines, where they eventually travel throughout the bloodstream and target the site of pain. The problem is, however, that it can take up to two hours to be fully effective. But to get a better idea of how women do use these medications during their cycles, we conducted research of their use behaviors. And surprisingly, we found that 23% of women take more than the recommended dose of these medications. This is problematic because it leaves them particularly susceptible to negative side effects, such as stomach upset, ulceration, and even liver damage. You would think that taking more than the recommended dose of these pain medications would solve the problem, but for some women, they still need to go to their doctors to be prescribed something more serious. Commonly known, in the United States, 11.2 million women are on oral contraceptives, or the pill. But what is less commonly known is that 3.5 million of these women cite menstrual pain as one of the reasons that they take the pill. Shockingly, 1 million women in the United States cite period pain as the only reason that they take this medication. It seems ridiculous that women are turning to such a nuclear option and pumping their bodies full of hormones simply to deal with period pain. A lot of gynecologists and OBGYNs do not like prescribing the pill to deal with pain, mainly because that's not its intended purpose. One such notable gynecologist and author stated this would be similar to a mechanic placing a piece of duct tape on your car. It's a band-aid over the problem, but not actually fixing it. Our solution works in conjunction with a menstrual cup. A menstrual cup is a silicone cup that collects menstrual blood instead of absorbing it. It's used similarly as a tampon, but with none of the negative effects that tampons introduce such as microvaginal tears, toxic shock syndrome. In addition, tampons contain RAN and dioxin, which are known carcinogens. By utilizing the cup, we are offering women the most ecologically and biologically friendly option out there. Using this, we can transvaginally deliver the drug right to the site of action, decreasing the time that the woman has to wait for relief. In addition, because we bypass the liver, we only have to use a third of the drug that you would typically take orally, decreasing any negative effects from the drugs themselves. And so we'd like to reiterate again where we are and where we're going. Um, as mentioned, we are in the R&D stages of developing this product. We have a preliminary prototype and a working regulatory strategy. We're currently working on developing proof of concept sufficient enough that we can protect our intellectual property prior to going out and seeking partnerships with larger business industry giants that have the experience and the resources that can take this project to the next level. At this time, we believe that acquisition will be the most likely exit for our venture, especially because of the current FDA regulatory landscape, but also because what's most important to us is that this product be on a shelf of a CVS near you as soon as possible. And because we want to make this product a reality, we need resources. We need your networks and your introductions. Most specifically, we are looking for patent attorneys that can help us protect our invention, as well as both business and technical advisors that can help us get where we need to go. I'm Caitlin Hopkins. I'm pursuing my master's in biotechnology. And I'm Deanna Stuber. I'm currently going for my master's in biomedical engineering here at Brown University. As female scientists and entrepreneurs with a whole host of technical skills, along with our co-founder and advisor, we believe we are the right people to bring this into fruition. Our product could help the millions of women dealing with this pain for decades of their lives, positively impacting women worldwide. Our product could allow women to feel and perform at 100%, 100% of the time. Thank you so much for your attention. We've come to our <clears throat> final exciting venture pitch uh, for B-Lab 2017. 
These guys are working in a very interesting area of creating um, marketplaces for new entrepreneurs and service providers. Good evening, and thank you for sticking around. I'm Adam, this is Isaac, and this is John, and we are the Pangeans. The side hustle economy is exploding. More and more Americans are becoming reliant on side jobs or side hustles as their own in order to make ends meet and find fulfillment in their lives. Already, more than 44 million Americans work outside their typical nine to five. This is nearly 30% of the workforce. Among millennials, this number is even higher at 40% having a self-identified side hustle. So why is this? A recent study conducted at Oxford University found that nearly 50% of the US workforce, these are people working everything from transportation to manufacturing to office jobs, are at risk of losing their jobs due to automation. The 40-hour work week is dying. There is a need for individuals seeking income and impact to have effective tools to promote their offerings in their local community. The current peer-to-peer -peer service uh, market simply isn't built for the multi-dimensional needs and lives people live. Craigslist, which is the most open platform available, is clunky and anonymous, leaving you with no real idea who or what you're dealing with. On the other hand, platforms such as Uber or Postmates or TaskRabbit dictate what you do, how you do it, and how much you charge. They limit the innovation and creativity of hardworking people. What if you don't want to drive a car? What if you don't want to put together IKEA furniture? Building an open platform that incentivizes individuals to create and innovate as they see fit will solve infinitely more problems than any prepackaged solution. And this is why we built Pangea. We've provided the tools for any individual to connect with their local community and discover what everyone around them has to offer. Each user can negotiate the terms of each transaction, pay and get paid in app, and establish a reputation through our rating and review system. We split up our app into three main public feeds. One for services, one for goods, and if you can't find what you're looking for, we have one for requ requests. Although elements of, of Pangea exist on other platforms, to replicate what we are doing, you would need something like 30 specialized apps on your iPhone. No one else has combined a high fidelity marketplace with a social network designed to facilitate personal connections. We're proud of what we built, and we're really excited to bring what we have to market. Now, we know starting a new marketplace is not going to be easy, especially if we were to market it to everyone everywhere. To make this problem more manageable, we decided to focus in on highly interconnected, underemployed, and highly skilled communities, college campuses. The National Center for Education Statistics found that 86% of US undergrads are on some form of financial aid. These are individuals who could really use some extra income. On top of this, our own Pangea study revealed that 84% of undergrads are underemployed, meaning they have at least one marketable skill that simply lacks an accessible marketplace. As a recent graduate myself, I know how difficult it is to find a part-time job that fits with a student's hectic schedule, is rewarding, and is aligned with an individual's own interests. Our official launch will be at Brown, Rizzi, and Johnson Wales campuses this September. Once we've iterated, polished our product, and gained traction, we plan on expanding to colleges throughout Rhode Island come spring semester and continue to expand to targeted colleges across the nation come the next academic year. There are 20.5 million college students in the US. For now, we are targeting just over 300,000 of them at these 20 schools and believe we could get over 50,000 students buying, selling, and engaging on our platform by the end of this 18-month launch plan. Initially, our revenue comes from a 10% commission that we take on the provider side of the transaction. We'll then roll out premium tools for providers, such as an enhanced profile or an enhanced post, or expanding your radius of visibility. Down the road, we'll have incredibly valuable data analytics regarding people's direct buying patterns that we will leverage to our in-house and third-party advertising plans. This team is built from 100% heart and grit. It's been two plus years since I first showed a business plan to Adam. He brought John to the equation, and we created Pangea. We've been bootstrapping and hustling ever since, doing whatever we can to make this a reality. John is the technical mind, has built Pangea almost single-handedly. Adam is the business mind, truly loves him some numbers, and myself have been working on bringing Pangea to reality almost longer than it's appropriate to admit.
Starting tonight, we will be raising $500,000 to enable us to execute on our 18-month plan. We aim to get over 50,000 users, of them 12,000 offering some kind of service. We predict that by the end of this period, we will have over $400,000 transacted on Pangea a month. Our team is motivated and driven by the fact that we recognize the world is changing rapidly, and those changes will have human consequences. Trends such as automation will cause wide-scale job displacement and a growing lack of face-to-face -face interaction. We need to adapt. To get ahead of these trends, Pangea will enable self-employment, inspire innovation and entrepreneurship, and facilitate connections that go beyond just a transaction. We are the Pangeans, and we go live on the App Store tomorrow. If you'd like to be a part of this journey, come talk to us. Thank you. Okay, way to go. These are uh, presentations that are really a snapshot in time on the development of new ventures. We sometimes get asked, you know, what has happened to people who have been in prior B Labs? And we brought today two examples, one from the 2015 class of B Lab and one from 2016. Uh, and they're going to just give a very brief update of what's happened to them since they've been in B Lab. The first is Vitae Industries. It's a pharmaceutical play uh, that's, that's uh, been enjoying tremendous success recently. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and as Jason mentioned, we were a member of the first inaugural uh, Brown Summer B Lab, and we've grown pretty rapidly since then. And so we build technology that automates the production of customized prescriptions for patients. In one way is going to, there we go. Currently, prescriptions and most prescription medicines are one or a few size fits all. You get prescribed a pill by the doctor, you go to your local CVS or other pharmacy, and they pull it out of a bottle on the shelf. If you need something that's custom, it's very difficult to get. There are some specialized pharmacies that do make custom medications today, but the problem is it's an entirely manual process, it's extremely inefficient, and it's pretty inaccurate too. It can be double of what the label says you're getting. So we wanted to create a technology platform that allows these pharmacies to make custom prescriptions for their patients in less time, more accurately, and so we created an automated, automated 3D printing based platform. You can see one of our early prototypes here. And so we used existing 3D printer technology and we innovated on the polymer chemistry and on the software and on some new technology within the printer to ensure that every patient will get a tablet from our device or a soft shoe or a gummy even. We can even print custom gummies for kids or if anybody would prefer their prescriptions as gummies, we can do that too. And so B-Lab was instrumental in getting us some of our initial mentors and helping us build our team. Danny, who I see in the back here tonight, is one of our earliest mentors and advisors to the company. Uh, Thorne Sparkman of um, Slater Fund is one of our early investors as well, and also another uh, mentor from B-Lab who we still speak with on basically a monthly base basis is Annette Tonti. So our team is largely built from Brown and Janine, our co-founders from Harvard, but we, we give her a break for that one. <laughs> Because we have, in addition to me, I graduated uh, in 2015 with a degree in biomedical engineering. We also have two PhD chemists from Brown. We're actually bringing on our third PhD chemist in just a few weeks in mid-October. Again, a PhD chemist from Brown. And so we bring together uh, expertise across chemistry, business, and computer science to help build this platform and make it a reality. So to this date, we've raised over $2 million in venture capital. Um, we have also are sponsoring studies uh, at Rhode Island Hospital that deal with precision dosing. Our most recent round was closed just uh, about a month ago and was led by Lear Capital. Um, we're always on the lookout for new talent in, the, in uh, the computer science or the engineering side of things. So if you know anybody, I know uh, when graduation comes around, please feel free to reach out to us. We're located just down the street on Wickenden Street, so if anybody wants to come visit us at any time, please feel free. We're on the corner of Brook and Wickenden Street. And so again, any, if you need help with anything or want to learn a little, about, a little bit about the experience of starting a company out of Brown, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We're always happy to chat. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. Uh, our graduates from 2016, come on down, guys. Uh, 
another, another technology company, these guys have been working in the area of um, uh, personal health, rape, rape kit detection, and, and uh, uh, assault. Do you have a second mic? Yes, we do. Second mic. Testing, testing. No, no, no slides. No slides. We are, is on. Uh, we're slideless. It's hard to compete with Vite, but we will try. Uh, my name is Richard Park. And I'm Bella Kitty, and we're the co-founders of Tech Against Assault. So Tech Against Assault was very founded out of Professor Danny Warshay's Engine 1010 class. We were working on a project that we weren't interested in as much as we wanted to be. And so outside of it, we kind of brainstormed, we ideated how could we create a venture that we cared about on a personal level as well as on an intellectual level. And so out of that came Tech Against Assault. Tech Against Assault is a research and development company that's creating biotechnology-based indicators to introduce into rape kits so that survivors who seek medical care leave healthcare centers with a lot more information than what they're being currently provided. And so if you think about a survivor who's undergone a very traumatic experience, going into a healthcare center and being told, you will only have your rape kit tested if you report your assault, most survivors don't, and you have to wait four to 12 months, which is a national average, to have your rape kit tested. And so there are all these obstacles for survivors, and what we wanna do is bring this indicator as a first tool uh, among many that we're currently thinking about, and making sure that all survivors have these obstacles um, broken down over time and to make sure that any survivor has that option and has the confidence to seek medical care. Uh, so we've been working on this for about a year and a half now. We were incorporated in April and we were lucky 20. enough, April 2016, and we were lucky enough to participate in uh, amazing accelerators like the B Lab, the Breakthrough Lab, uh, Mass Challenge in Boston, where we were able to get some funding, as well as the Swear Center Embark Fellowship, which gave us our startup funds in order to survive this first year. And so we've been working hard trying to pull together all the stakeholders within our community. We're talking hospitals, advocates, survivors themselves, because they, um, they lead the change in their space and we want to en enable that. Um, and so in pulling these stakeholders, we've been working to develop a technology. And so we're currently within pro the prototyping phase in order to develop these indicators that would be used within the rape exams. And so currently we're looking at relationships with the social uh we're looking at interesting relationships with the NIH and the NSF, um, looking at their models of funding through the Small Business Innovation Research uh, Program, but also how those programs can be more socially minded. Um, just uh, other programs like that uh, are in the works. And let's see, what do we hope to accomplish in the next year? Uh, our main goal is to get this prototype out because uh, I don't know if you mentioned, we have an innovation voucher uh, which is a Rhode Island-based uh, grant program that provides $50,000 so that a research institution in Rhode Island can conduct research on your behalf. And so we've partnered up with the Department of Health, which houses Rhode Island's only forensic lab that tests rape kits, so that as we develop iterations of our technology, the forensic lab can validate to ensure that what we're doing doesn't hinder their ability to do the great work that they do. And so for the next year, we'll be working on prototyping, creating iterations, getting those iterations to the Department of Health, and then getting those back, feeding that back into how we develop further and making sure that it's all in the progress of uh, getting SBIR relationships out of the way and moving forward. Okay. And so I think it's, it's fitting at this point because it's like we've been here for one year to say thank you. I feel like Brown has very much contributed to our success. It's where we became biomedical engineers. It's where we got to meet each other. It's where we got to find our passion. And I'm so happy that we were able to share that passion with the rest of Brown. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> We are almost done, you guys. You've been staring at this logo uh, all evening long, and it's there because we wanted to emphasize that the Breakthrough Lab is a program within the Jonathan M. Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. And uh, I want to introduce my good friend, uh, Danny Warshe. He's the executive director of the center. He's going to say just a few words. As he comes down, however, I want to acknowledge that without the help of our other uh, uh, Nelson Center staff, Jonas Clark and Liz Malone, both of whom just uh, booked out the back of the, of the room to get set up for the reception. 
but I can't, I can't express my gratitude enough for those guys, and I'm sure you guys agree that they're just fantastic. So, Danny. Thank you, Jason. I realize I'm the only thing standing between all of you and refreshments, so I will be brief. Um, but first of all, another round of applause for all the wonderful B-Lab teams. That is not easy, and I can see you're breathing a sigh of relief, but I know how much effort and diligence and tenacity went into those wonderful presentations. So really, job excellently done. I know it's also only a small reflection, not only of your pitch, but of all the work you undertook in the Breakthrough Lab for eight weeks this summer, and I hope it's going to um, augur good times ahead in terms of all sorts of additional learning and success that you'll have from this point forward. So thank you for an excellent job. Well done. Uh, just show me your hand if this is your first event organized by the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, not surprising, given that it's the start of a new year. We've been around here only a year ourselves. I like to say that we're a startup. And you know that uh, last year, exactly at this time, we hit the ground sprinting and uh, achieved quite a bit over that first year and are looking to propel that momentum forward. I'll mention just briefly that if you are not already on our email distribution list, please go to entrepreneurship.brown.edu. There you can find out a little bit more about our mission, what we do, what we're looking to do, ways to engage with us moving forward. There is a whole host of activity happening on campus and beyond campus, and we welcome your participation uh, in all ways. I'll say also for any of you who are new to Brown, just walk through the Van Wickle gates, that B-Lab is admittedly at the far end of the spectrum of what we call empowerment in the developmental pathway we've liked to organize. But there's lots of activity that's appropriate for you to take some first steps in the part that we call engagement. Uh, we, our staff, are very happy to meet with you. We have a whole host of what we call peer entrepreneurs in residence who are students, just like many of you, who have been through my course uh, or who have otherwise learned a little bit about the entrepreneurial process and are very happy to share that wisdom with you. Uh, so eventually, we look forward to your applying and participating in future B-Labs. In fact, that process is already starting. This is a year-round process for us, not a summer process, not a fall process. We are about to kick off the next cycle of applications for uh, next summer's B-Lab, and we look forward to recruiting lots of you who are here today if you are so inspired. The last thing I'm going to do is echo what Jason did, which is to issue a number of thank yous which are essential because this, the lifeblood of B-Lab and of the Jonathan M. Nelson Center, is the people behind it. Those of you who have taken my class remember that John Doerr quote, I'd rather bet on an A team with a B idea than a B team with an A idea. I'd like to think we have both, an A team and an A idea, but we certainly have an A team. And I want to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, first of all, Jared Finn, who's a new colleague because he was the uh, student intern we had this summer uh, in B-Lab, and he went way beyond the expectations of what anybody might dream of uh, for a student intern. So thank you, Jared. Thank you also to my star colleagues, uh, Liz Malone, our all-star program manager. Let's give Liz a big round of applause. <laughs> to Jonas Clark, our associate director. To Jason Harry, the director of B-Lab. To all the mentors that are represented by Deb Mills Schofield and others, if you take a close look, at all the people that contributed to this year's B-Lab, it really does take a village, a village of B-Lab, many of whom are here tonight, many of whom are not, but really want to extend our thanks to all those folks who uh, extended themselves throughout the summer and through the year. I want to thank Rick Locke, uh, Linda Murphy from the Provost's office, again, Barrett Hazeltine, and all the leadership of Brown University who realize that the Nelson Center is so essential to the mission that Brown stands for. Our mission is making entrepreneurship 
an essential part of the Brown experience. We had 200 seats available today and well over 300 people signed up. There's a whole other room filled with people for overflow downstairs. So without further ado, I'm gonna welcome everybody outside for refreshments. You'll be able to meet with the teams. Thank you again for coming tonight.